Everybody, Pastor Sabrina here, and with me today is Pastor Zach. And we're here to fill you guys in on what's happening in our individual ministries as well as what's going on here at Branchline Church. Yeah, we want you to know all things Branchline, what's going on. And so, on that note, Pastor Sabrina, what's happening with B Kids? Well, in B Kids, if you guys want to keep up to date, you can follow us at our Instagram account. It's at B Kids BLC. We are also starting a brand new series called True Story today, where we're going through the book of Acts and looking at the early church. So, kiddos, go get some paper and something to write with because we're going to get started really soon. Yeah, I got some bad news. I forgot my paper and crayons this week. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. I know. I'll have to go grab them quick. I'll get them ready. But you want to hear a true story, Pastor Sabrina? I do. See what I did there, guys? But with impact, we had for, for the first time, a male student won the home scavenger hunt. So, Caden, congratulations to you. Way to represent us males well. Hope to see you back next week to defend your title. But we had a lot of other good things happening with impact. Had students sharing their testimonies, their stories with one another this past Wednesday. And so, if you're wondering what else is happening with impact, you can follow us on Instagram at ImpactBLC, as well as on Facebook, Hastings Impact. Now, this morning, we love to give everyone a chance to give. There's four different ways you can give online, via text, through the app, as well as through a check in the mail. And just want to say a huge thank you on behalf of Branch Line Church for your generosity during this time. You all have been absolutely amazing. And even last week, we had those prayers scrolling across the bottom of the screen during worship, and your response has blown us away. We've had so many of you say you're joining others in prayer. Some of you have even stepped up in action to bless some families. And so I want to encourage you, if you have any prayer requests you'd love to have the church be praying for alongside of you, Email us, let us know, as well as if you want to maybe bless a family and help out those in need, let us know as well as we can help connect you with ways to do that. And now you maybe notice that Pastor Sabrina is no longer sitting next to me, and this is just what happens sometimes when you're recording. Things don't always go right. And so on that note, actually, if you want to stick around to the end of the service, we've put together a bit of a blooper reel of some of the things that don't always come out as smoothly as you maybe expect. So please stick around to the end of the service to see that and get a good laugh in.
But I also want to let you know about an awesome, awesome opportunity we have coming up on May 16th. It's a Saturday at 945. We're going to meet on 18th Street, right by the Veterans Home, to do a parade for them. And so we're encouraging you to decorate your your cars, to write letters, draw pictures. We'll collect those all that morning because we want to celebrate and encourage and, and support all of our veterans that are there. So we'd love to see you May 16th, 945 at the Vets Home to do a parade for them. And now this morning, we're going to go into worship. And like I said last week, I would love for you to be a part of worship, whether that means standing for you, kneeling, maybe even just leaning in a little bit more. We really want you to connect to God during this time. And so Pastor Ian's going to lead us in worship. You are the only king forever Almighty God, we lift you 
the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your love and kindness Taught through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ My Lord join me in prayer. Father God, we come to you. And God, if there is ever a moment where we need you, I mean right now in our generation, if there was ever a moment in the timeline of life where we are desperate for you, it is now, sir. And God, I know that each one of us has had a week and I just pray that you would meet us right where we're at. 
that you would prepare our hearts to hear from you, to hear from you, sir. We want to hear from you, which means, sir, get me out of the way. Please get me out of the way and use my lips, use my body language, use all that I am to speak to your people. Holy Spirit, come alive. Come alive in our homes. Speak to us in our homes. and Speak to us wherever we're at, sir. In Jesus' name we pray and the church said, amen. Well, good. I'm so glad to stand in front of you today. And I just want to say, my name is Joe Hanna, and I have the privilege and honor to lead Branchline Church. And we're going to continue our series where we're confronting the question, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? In the midst of COVID-19, in the midst of a very challenging season that we're walking into and we're in the middle of right now, We're asking the question, how are you feeling? I know a lot of us, we want to feel happy. We want to be excited about the new normal. We want to be excited about our future. But the reality is we're sad. We're sad about uh, what was. We're grieving what what it felt like, what it looked like, what we were able to do in the past. I mean, we want to be cool, calm, and collected Like, God's got this, I'm 100% trusting him, and yet we're on this roller coaster, if you're anything like me, where there's moments where I'm experiencing anxiety, worry, I'm overwhelmed. I mean, we want to be cheerful. We want to think about our future. We know that God is with us. He will never leave us. But when we think about our future, we don't know what the new normal is going to be. We don't know the unexpected. We don't know the unknown. And so it causes frustration. It causes frustration. And and some of you, if you can relate with me, I mentioned this two weeks ago, you're just feeling numb. Like just numb. You don't even know, what's my purpose right now? What's my purpose as we move into the future? I can't predict anything. And so I'm just numb. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? We've learned that we all have emotions, and God created us with emotions. In fact, we learned that Jesus in the Gospels experienced 39 different emotions, which means he can relate with us, but it also tells us that emotions aren't bad. Emotions aren't bad. In fact, emotions emotions are like vehicles. They're like vehicles, and emotions bring us one way or the other. It can bring us one way, one of two ways. Emotions can bring us closer to God, uh, bring us to a place where we're in his presence, where we know his near, he's near. It can bring us to a place where we're fulfilling our plan and our purpose, or emotions can, again, they're a vehicle that bring us somewhere, or they can be, bring us to isolation, they can bring us to despair, They can bring us to disappointment. They can bring us to depression. But emotions are like, it's it's like a vehicle. It brings us somewhere. And so I don't know what your top emotion is right now, but maybe it's loneliness. I know a lot of us are lonely right now, and the question to ask when you're thinking about your emotion is, where is your emotion taking you? Like, where is your emotion taking you? If you're frustrated right now, where's your emotion taking you? Is it taking you closer to God? Closer where you're more dependent on him? Or are you depending on your own strength, your own wisdom? But emotions, it's it's good to ask the question, where are your emotions taking you? Don't ask the question, is your emotion bad? No emotion is bad. No emotion is weak. Uh, emotions are attached to the fact that we are human. And so emotions are like a vehicle. They bring us somewhere. And we're to ask the question, where is that emotion taking us? And today I want to talk to you about the emotion of shame. The emotion of shame. 
Shame is interesting. Um, again, I'm not an expert on this, but I've spent some, some time looking at this. Shame can come from four different places. Again, there might be more than this, but it can come from what someone's done to you, what someone hasn't done for you, what you've done, or what you haven't done. What we know about shame is shame can destroy relationships. Uh, shame can steal our strength. It can sap our strength. It can strip away our confidence. It can make us think that we're not worthy, that um, we're damaged goods. Shame, we know that it can bring us in two different directions. Shame can bring us in the direction of isolation, where we isolate ourselves because we, we don't feel good about who we are. We don't feel worthy of uh, love from others. We don't feel like we deserve uh, being known or belonging to anyone. Shame can bring us to isolation. It can also bring about secretive, secretism or uh, being secretive. Uh, where uh, maybe you've, you've said this to someone. And this would identify that you've wrestled with shame. I've, I've said this to people. Like, don't go there. Don't go, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want, to, I don't want it at the surface. I've covered that. I've hid that. I, that's in my past. I don't want that to impact my present or even my future. Nope, don't go there. Don't go there. Uh, shame can also cause us to be judgmental. Uh, those of us that deal with shame, and we all do, we often like people to feel just as bad as we do. And so often when we're experiencing shame, we like to shame others. And so you can go down the road of isolation, being secretive or judgmental, or you can allow shame to cause you to go down a path where you find God's grace, his, his mercy, and you find freedom. Freedom from the weight of shame. We're going to learn that shame, with shame comes a lot of weight. A lot of weight that you and I carry around, um, weight... Um, that we're, we're feeling weight, weight from our past, weight from things that we've done or haven't done, or even weight about what people have done to us. So God wants us to be set free from this emotion of shame, and he wants us to allow him to enter into that emotion. And in order for us to kind of begin that process, and please understand that, that shame involves a process, Shame isn't something that you and I conquer overnight. Shame is something where through a relationship with Jesus, we gradually over time proclaim victory or proclaim victory over seasons of shame. So let's define shame. In order for us to best define shame, we have to talk about both shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. Shame is where you focus on yourself. Guilt is when you focus on your behavior. Shame is when you say, I am bad. Guilt is when you say, I did something bad. And so, how many of you, if I did something, or if you wronged me, if you hurt me, you would come back and say, I'm sorry, Joe, I made a mistake. How many of you would say that? Most of you would say, I'm sorry, Joe, I made a mistake. That's guilt. Guilt is you saying, I'm sorry I made a mistake. Shame is, I'm sorry I am a mistake. Shame and guilt are completely different. Shame is where it tries to tell you that you're not enough. Shame is where it tries to tell you that you're not strong enough, smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're unworthy, you're unlovable, you're damaged goods. Um, there's a big question that, that shame tries to shove down your throat, my throat, it's who do you think you are? Uh, this question comes up for me when I'm in the context of a conversation. Like I'm sitting around with big pastors, pastors that are leading thousands of people or, or have been pastors for 35, 40 years, and I know that they are theological giants. And so they're talking about end times, they're talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And I immediately am confronted with the question, who do you think you are? I mean, you only have 15 years of being a pastor. You, yeah, you've been a Christian for 23 years, but you've only got 15. Who do you think you are? You're not smart enough to even 
be in this conversation. Or I've been in conversations with people talking about parenting. And I just got done dealing with my kids hiccuping. And so I'm immediately confronted with the question, who, who do you think you are? You think you can contribute to this conversation? Or, or, or maybe you're single. And you're sitting amongst a, a bunch of folks that have been married for a, a season. And you're, think, and, and you're confronted with the question, who do you think you are? That's what shame does. Shame speaks to our identity. It tells us that you're not worthy, that you're not strong enough, that you don't have what it takes. It's one of the worst things on the planet. Worst things on the planet. Shame speaks to our identity. Shame and guilt are completely different. And I've learned that shame is heavily connected to addiction. It's heavily connected to depression, suicide, aggression, and eating disorders. And we can understand why, because when we don't feel good about who we are, we like to numb it. We like to suppress it. We like to hide it. And so we try to do that through substance abuse or through hiding behind whatever it is. And so it's heavily connected to these things. And shame is interesting because 99% of the time, when it comes to shame, you and I are our biggest critic. It's not necessarily what people think about us. It's not even what people have said about us or what people have done to us. We are our biggest critic. We know the full context of our life. And so we're the biggest critic. And so now, how do we manage the emotion of shame? We all deal with it. How do we manage it? And what we're going to do is we're going to turn to a psalm. Uh, David, David pens a lot of the psalms. And David is a mighty warrior, he is a powerful king, and he's labeled a man after God's own heart. And I want you to keep that in mind. Everyone put a man after God's own heart. If you're a woman after God's own heart, write that down. I want us to enter. Every single time we preach to you, our heart is is that you enter into the character the character situation, and then as you enter into the character situation, like you ask the question, how does this relate to my life? How would I have responded here? What does God speak to me about this situation as he's speaking to this character? The hope is you enter in, and so we're going to speak about David. I know he's a male, but if you're a woman, please try and put yourself in his situation. He's dealing with shame, and he's going to talk to us about how we manage shame how he lived in shame for a season, and the process that he went through to be set free from shame. And so if you have your Bible, if you could open up to Psalm chapter 32. So we're going to turn to Psalm chapter 32, but I want to put you to put a pen there or a piece of paper there or even your journal there. And then also open up 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, and we're going to flip back and forth there. And as you kind of get to those two places, I want to give you some context. I want to give you the cliff notes. Again, David is going to talk about this season in his life where he is feeling the weight of shame, where he's dealing with um, this lie, shame is a lie, uh, this belief about himself, and It comes out of his sin. It comes out of his guilt for his sin. And that guilt starts defining who he is. He's going to talk about the weight that he's carrying because of his guilt and shame. But then he's also going to talk about the process by which we get set free from it. And so let me give you some context. If you walk into 2 Samuel chapter 11, you read about the affair between David and Bathsheba. A lot of you know the context of this story. But if you don't, let me share it. David is king, and he goes out on top of the palace, and he walks out on the roof. And as he's out on the roof, he stares down onto another roof, and he sees a very beautiful woman bathing, Bathsheba bathing. And scholars, it's crazy as I was studying about this, but they're like, we're all guessing that David, this isn't the first time he's seen Bathsheba. He knew that when he stepped out on that rooftop, he probably knew that Bathsheba was going to be out there. This isn't the first time he's visited this website. He knew who Bathsheba was. And we read in chapter 11 that he turns to his servants and he's like, hey, hey guys, come over here. Who is this? Who, who is this, this woman? And, and they're all looking at him like, David, that's Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. 
And David, he knew who Uriah was. I mean, this guy was one of David's mighty men. He was in battle after battle. He, he lost blood with this guy. And so he knew who Uriah was. And again, the servants were like, David, you don't want to go there. This is Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. And David looks at them and says, go get her. And again, I'm giving you cliff notes. They go get her. And David sleeps with Bathsheba. And you read a little bit of the story, the context of the story, and you see that David thinks he's going to get away with this. He really does. He, he thinks he's going to get away with this, but a couple days later, he finds out that Bathsheba is, she's pregnant. And so plan A, plan A is he comes up with this creative idea to keep it covered, to keep it in secret, um, and to keep this thing isolated. He has this idea to go get Uriah out of battle. All the men, David and a few men, are, are at the, the kingdom, per se, and the rest of the men are out fighting a battle. And Uriah is with these men, and they're fighting this battle. And so he calls Uriah in from battle with the hope that with Uriah coming home, he's going to go home and sleep with Bathsheba. But Uriah comes, and this is plan A, and, and he comes and he's like, and David's like, go home to your wife, go home and sleep, to, 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 you know, chill, to relax. And, and Uriah looks at David and is like, What? I ain't going home to my wife. I ain't going home to a comfortable bed. These men are out there fighting for our kingdom. I'm not going to dishonor them by going home. Are you kidding me? No way. And so David's plan A doesn't work. And so he has to come up with plan B. And plan B is, again, he's trying to isolate this situation, cover it, hide it. He decides that he's going to send Uriah back out to the battlefield with a letter. A letter that is confidential and it's sent to the commander Joab. And Joab, uh, he gets this letter, it's confidential, and, and he reads this letter and it says this, send Uriah to the front of the battle line. And David knew that by that request, it would cause or bring about Uriah's death. And so David allows this sin one sin after another to trickle from one to the next. And David is now carrying the weight of all of this. And he just continues to rock. We read this in 2 Samuel eleven twenty six through 27. So now Uriah has died. And when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. Of course she did. Verse 27, after the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house. Again, he's trying to cover this thing up. And she became his wife and bore him a son. Now scholars speculate that over a year has passed now. David has not repented. And I, sing, I, I, I bring that up. I'm not going to sing that. I bring that up. Because I want you to know that God is a God of second chances. Like God, is, God calls David a man after his own heart. God calls you a woman after God's own heart. And guess what? Sometimes we find ourselves in sin. And one sin leads to another. But God, guess what? Our God is a God of second chances. He is a God of four chances. He is a God of eight chances. Our God never gives up on us. He will do whatever it takes to bring us back into a right relationship with him where we are fluid. God finishes what he begins. He who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And so scholars speculate that a year went by and then we run into this statement. But the thing that David had done, it displeased the Lord. And so this is the context. This is the context of Psalm 32. David is going to let us in on, in, in, in on his life where he is wrestling with shame. He is wrestling with guilt. He has these lies that he's done. He's had these acts that he's done. And they're impacting his identity, his ability to see himself the way that God sees him. And then he's going to talk about how he is set free from that. And so I want to just tell, share a quick story of how that happened in my life. Uh, Back in the early 90s, I was a sophomore in high school, and I don't know why, but my dad didn't allow me to come to Hastings to hang out. Uh, there was a couple things that took place in the early 90s that, honestly, the majority of the people from Cottage Grove weren't allowed to come down to Hastings. But sure enough, one of my friends ends up 
um, dating a gal that um, from Hastings. And he invites me and some of my buddies to a Hastings High School dance. I know, crazy, Cottage Grove people going to a Hastings High School dance, but it happens. And so we wandered down to a dance, and sure enough, my aunt is chaperoning this thing. And so I walk in there, and within the first 10 minutes, my aunt walks up to me and says, Hey, Joey, I'm so glad. My family all calls me Joey. Hey, Joey, I'm so glad to see you. And so we chit-chat, we connect. And as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking of my conversation with my father. Like the weight of this conversation with my aunt is landing on my shoulders, and I'm immediately thinking in the future, like I've got to confront this thing. I know my aunt's going to bring this up. And so I'm carrying the weight. The rest of my night was terrible. My aunt didn't end up talking to my dad until three days later. And so three days later, my aunt calls my my dad, and so they're having conversation. My aunt didn't know she was doing anything wrong. She didn't know that I wasn't supposed to be down in Hastings. I never brought that up. And so she flippantly talks about the fact that she ran into her nephew, Joey. And my dad gets off the phone and immediately, Joe, get up here. And I knew at that moment I had to confront the fact that I had stepped over in a boundary that my dad had given me. But I want to talk about that for a brief moment because we've all been at this place before. I I finally was carrying this weight and I was thinking that carrying this weight for three days was worth it. Like maybe this thing would all blow over and David was probably thinking this exact same thing. Like maybe this thing will all blow over and he was thinking that the carrying the weight of this guilt, carrying the weight of these actions was, was okay, like it was worth it than confronting the sin. But I'm telling you that day when my dad, I sat in front of him and I owned my sin, I acknowledged my sin and I said, Dad, I'll never do that again. At that moment, I had to deal with the consequence of my actions, but I was able to take a breath. I believe there's some of you right now, you're listening to this talk, and I believe that God wants to give you your breath back. He wants you to be able to take a deep breath. Everyone take a deep breath breath right now because David's story opens up a window. It gives us a pathway to freedom, to being set free from the way that we see ourselves, from the way that we've allowed others to define us. And so David, he walks us into this moment and he lets us know that, he, he lets us know that shame is a result of sin. And he's going to say this in Psalm 32, 1 through 2, he's like, blessed. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. He is, he's identifying like sin, our actions, our behavior, it impacts our identity. Again, I am, um, guilt is, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Shame is, I'm sorry, I am a mistake. And guilt over time, it impacts Our statement of saying, I am a mistake. And David is saying, blessed, happy. A freedom is found in in the one who knows that your transgressions have been forgiven when you know that your sins have been covered. Blessed is the one who, who knows that your sin is not counted against when it comes to God and in whose spirit there is no deceit, in whose spirit there is no lying, Like that happened to me that day with my dad. Like I was set free from this lie. I was set free from this secret. I was set free from this thing I was trying to cover up. And I was all of a sudden able to take a breath. And and David's like, listen, if you're dealing with shame, you're dealing with the emotion of shame, the best way for you to take a breath is for you to acknowledge the fact that, that sin, shame is the result of Sin, sin can, can point to a sin that's been committed against you or sin that you have committed yourself. Shame is a result of sin. David, again, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. Transgressions, um, it, it, it means something deep here. It's intentional sin. It's willful sin. It's you and I knowing the boundary, knowing that we're not to go to Hastings, and we willfully going to a Hastings high school dance. It's us willfully. Transgressions 
David's like, blessed is someone who knows that your transgressions are forgiven. And don't miss this, please. Don't miss this. Please underline this. When you know that you're trans, the first step for us proclaiming freedom, the first step for us stepping down the path of us managing our emotion of shame is for us to acknowledge our sin. And David, he, he doesn't say he slipped up. He doesn't say he messed up. He doesn't blame it on his parents. He doesn't blame it on his buddy. He doesn't blame it on his circumstance. He calls sin what it is. It's a sin. It's a transgression. It's a willful, intentional, him stepping over the boundary that he knew God had placed in his life to protect him, to keep him safe, to keep him healthy, to keep him in a right relationship, not only with God, but with others, where it's fluid, where it's free, where he believes that he is enough, where he believes that he is loved, that he is worthy. That's what God wants for us, but he knows that when we step over the boundary and we intentionally sin, it's all of a sudden going to cause guilt that eventually is going to trickle over and impact our identity. David, and God knew this, I believe this with every ounce of my being, uh, Genesis 50-20 is a big verse for me right now. I'll be going through what we're going through because uh, it says what Satan meant for harm, God meant for good. And so Satan, yes, he meant to harm David in this, but God meant it for good. And so we're going to see God transition this to good. In fact, God is going to teach David something where you and I are going to be able to learn something through David's circumstance. And how we step down the path that leads to freedom from the emotion of shame. David's going to talk about the weight of, of his shame, the weight of his shame, the guilt of his shame that eventually impacted his identity where he started to believe that he was a mistake. He's going to talk about the weight of that, how our emotions impact our physical well-being, how our emotions impact our spiritual well-being. He says this in Psalm 32, 3 through 4, when I kept silent, Like when I held this in, when I kept this as an isolated case, my bones started wasting away through my groaning all day long. This wasn't something that was just impacting me in the morning. This wasn't something that was just impacting me at a moment in the day or when I was watching a movie. No, this was impacting me all the time. It was impacting my physical well-being. He continues, for day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. David is letting us know that the result of shame is it saps our strength. It tears away at our confidence. It it makes us feel like we are unworthy. And so you and I, what we begin to do in this shame is we start to walk around this weight on our shoulders. I believe that there's a lot of us walking around with weight on our shoulders and God wants to set you free. He wants to set you free. He wants you to know he wants you to see yourself the way he sees you. He wants, you, he wants your identity be, to be defined by Jesus and what Jesus has done, not by what you have done. He wants you to define, um, he doesn't want others to define you. He wants to define you. He wants you to know that he sees you through Jesus. Because shame tells us a different story. Shame reminds us of what we've done. Shame reminds us that because of what's happened to us in the past, we are disqualified, that we are not enough, that we don't have what it takes. And so David, who had a relationship with God, was carrying this weight. And he was thinking to himself that it's better to carry this weight than to confront his sin. And I believe that there's some of you listening to this right now that think that same thing. But you think it's better to continue to carry 
that thing that's happened to you, that thing that you did or didn't do, you think it's better to carry that around. But I'm letting you know that right now, God is saying through me that there's a better way to live, that he wants you to experience freedom, that he wants you to take a breath. And he knows that some of you have been avoiding church. Some of you have been avoiding him. Some of you have been avoiding him because what God does, God is a kind God. He is a compassionate God. He is a patient God. And when we start stepping back into a relationship with him. He doesn't overwhelm us, but what he does do, because he is a God who finishes what he begins, he wants to transform us into the image of who Jesus is. And so in order to do that, he needs to step into your foyer, into your kitchen, into your living room, and eventually into your bedroom, baby. And so he starts to say, can, can we deal with that? Can we deal with that? And some of us, we avoid God because we know that he's going to say, can we deal with that? Because that's hindering us from being in a deeper relationship. That, that's hindering you from believing that you have a plan and purpose from me, that you have a calling from me, and that you are enough, and that you have access to my Holy Spirit, his power, his authority. Can, can we talk about that? And some of us, even David, David was even like, I don't want to go there, God. I don't want to go in a deeper relationship with you because I know I got to confront sin. And David knew, 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven, 27, the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Sin displeases the Lord. It's true. But everyone comment right now and say, but God, but God. Come on, everyone comment right now, but God. Yes, sin displeases God, but God, but God. He loves, but God loves you. He loves you. He's, he's patient. He's kind. He's compassionate. He knows the full context of your circumstance. And so God, he is not content with just sitting back and allowing us to carry that weight of shame. He wants to do something about it. And he does that for David. But guess what? God does it in his perfect timing. Come on, write out. God moves in his perfect timing. He moves in his perfect time. He knew when David would be ready. 2 Samuel 12, 1 says this, the Lord sent Nathan to David at the opportune time, at just the right moment, when he knew that David, David's heart was soft, when he knew that David was ready, at that moment, God in his love for David, God in his love for you, he's speaking through me right now, God in his love for you, he's sending Pastor Joe. God in his love for you is sending your small group. God in his love for you is sending your family member. God in his love for you, he never gives up. He sent Nathan to David and Nathan sits David down and he shares a story. A story that David didn't know it was a story, that it wasn't true. David thought it was true. He shares a parable with David and he leads out and he says this in 2 Samuel chapter 12. He's like, listen, there are two people living in a city. One person was poor, the other person was rich. The person who was rich had many, many sheep, and the person who was poor only had one sheep. And there was a traveler, a traveler who rolled up in the city, and of course he stopped at the rich man's house, knocked on the door, and he's like, listen, do you have anything to eat? And so the rich man's like, yeah, I got something to eat. And so what does he do? He goes over to the poor man's house. He steals the only, one and only sheep, the poor man has and he cooks it up and he feeds the traveler and listen to David's response listen to David's response to Nathan David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan as surely as the Lord lives the man who did this he must die he must die he must pay for that lamb four times over because he has done such a thing and had no pity no pity then Nathan said to David you are, you are that man. God was displeased with David's sin. He was displeased with what David had done. He sent Nathan, and Nathan confronted David's sin. He surfaced it. 
he took the cover off and it's like, David, we got to deal with this. And David at that moment, I mean, if, if we could only have been there, some of you have been there before, I know I have. Some of you are there right now. But at David in that moment, he fell to his knees. Nathan looked at him, he's like, listen, you didn't steal someone's sheep. You, you, had, you had sex with someone's wife. Not only that, but you had her husband kill David. David dropped to his knees. He finally realized that enough was enough. I'll never forget that day for me. I was 17 years old, 18 years old, and I found myself on my bedroom floor. And I was doing things. My behavior, I couldn't believe what I was doing. And my behavior was impacting my identity. And I was disgusted with myself. I was full of shame. I was ashamed of who I had become. I couldn't believe it. And as I thought about my future, and like, is this what my future looks like? No, this can't be. And that day, I found myself getting on my knees just like David, and I surrendered my life to God. I'm like, God, if you are real, I need to know that there's a different way. I need to know that there's a different behavior. I know that there's, need to know that there's a different way to live life, that there's a different way to see myself. And that day, God met me right where I was at, just like he met David, right where David was at. And David, at that moment, God started confronting him on his sin, talking to him about his actions, where David finally approached God and like, listen, I'm sorry I made a mistake. And God heard that, and immediately that opened a door for God to go to work on the fact that David was also saying, I'm sorry, I am a mistake. I am a mistake. So if this is speaking to you in any way, how do we manage the emotion of shame? David tells us this in Psalm 32, verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, O God, and I did not cover up my iniquity. And so what David did is he, he turned from he turned from that, that isolation, from that secretive secrecy. He turned from that judgmental life. He turned from his past and he turned to God. This is called repentance, turning from your sin and turning to God. And then he also acknowledged, this is the first steps, this is the first steps for you and I to begin to manage our emotion of shame Shame, he acknowledged and he confessed his transgressions to the Lord. And he says, you forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Second Samuel, again, this is tied directly together. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. Blessed is the person who knows that God has forgiven you of your transgressions, who has covered up your sin. At that moment, David was able to take a breath. At that moment, God was able to forgive David for his behavior. He is able to say, Jesus bought and paid for that sin. He bought and paid for it. That sin no longer defines you, David. And so now God went to work on the fact that David was believing that he was a mistake. And so I want to introduce you to a guy by the name of James. James is a guy that's very similar to all of us. Maybe his story isn't similar to yours, but at the end of the day, we all experience shame. And I want to show this story to you to help you see the process by which God goes through when we allow him to enter into our shame. Watch this. How long has it been since you've seen your family? Ooh, uh, close to 10 years. 10 years? Yeah. What's been the hesitancy? Because I've me messed up so many times before. You know, they've heard me say sorry a thousand times. 
I'm originally from Korea. My family and I moved here when I was six years old. In my culture, the family name means a lot. There's expectations attached to it. I brought a lot of shame to my family because I didn't uphold those expectations. I had a heroin addiction for over 20 years. The consequences are tremendous. I ended up alone on the street and I lost my family. Well, uh, Father God, thank you for waking us up this morning, cleaning us over in our right mind. Thank you for this food we're about to eat. Bless the hands for prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I live here at the Union Rescue Mission, a place to recover your soul and transform your life. I've been here for the past year and a half. Having to trust in God was really tough. I came to the realization of having to surrender. That's what he intended for me. Because of my pride and wanting to be in control, he had to humble me. You only feel his grace and his love for you when you surrender to him. This mission, this ministry exists to advance the kingdom of God. We want to follow the master. We want to be a part of the kingdom. Forgiveness is a part of the redemption. Restoration is a part of the process. That's why we're here. Forgiveness is a word to me that was foreign in the sense that I had asked for forgiveness numerous times from my family, but in all reality, I wasn't able to forgive myself for what I've done. Jesus is saying, if you're gonna be in the kingdom, you need to come to terms with the work of forgiveness in your own heart. Don't do any of this alone. Talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. I'm realizing that community is necessary. We have to be in relationships. We have to answer the hard questions. That's how we grow. So your brother sent you a friend request on Facebook. Why has that been sitting in your inbox for a month and you haven't responded? And I put off contact and or we're trying to reconnect with my family because I was, I always felt like I needed to bring something to the table, you know, but I'm not held by those expectations anymore. Why are you ready now? What's different about today? I feel like, you know, his friend request is telling me they're ready to forgive, or I say they. Um, he symbolizes my family right now. And you're ready. I'm ready to make it happen <laughs> or let it happen. Amen. Amen. This is it. You don't keep pictures of your family. No, I lost everything that, um, mm. and it was easier to deal with not having any uh, reminders, you know. I wasted a lot of time. Too long. I would like to make amends with all of them possible, but with God, I feel like everything's going to be okay, no matter what. This whole past year and a half is like a whole new life. God has slowly been restoring me. I relied on heroin to be 
the answer to everything. Now, I leave it to God. I'm just a lost child that, you know, has come to realize trust in God. That's it. Emotions. Emotions are like a vehicle. A vehicle that can bring us closer to God or further away from Him. Shame. Shame is an emotion that can cause us to move into isolation, become secretive and judgmental, or it can move us down a path towards God's grace, His mercy, His hope, and His confidence. James chose to surrender his life to God. And he had no idea what his future was going to look like. Just like you and I, we have no idea what our future looks like. But I'm telling you, if you choose to turn to God, acknowledge your sin, and allow him to enter into your shame, what God's promising you is, I love what that pastor said, forgiveness comes at our salvation. But restoration involves a process. When we allow God to enter into our shame, God speaks to us. He tells us that our sin, our shame, our guilt, our regret, it's been dealt with. It's been buried. It's no longer held against us. And when we enter into our presence of God, he, when, when, we, when we allow God to enter into our shame, he walks us through the process of restoration where he starts to tell us because of Christ, because of Christ, you are not what other people say about you. Because of Christ, you are not defined by your past. Because of Christ, you are not who you say you are. Because of Christ, you are not guilty. Because of Christ, you are not fill in the blank. When we allow God to enter into our shame, he begins the process of telling us that because of Christ, you are free. Because of Christ, you have an address in heaven. Because of Christ, you have purpose, you have significance. Because of Christ, you are loved. Because of Christ, you are worthy. Because of Christ, you are forgiven. Because of Christ, you are holy. Because of Christ, you are pure. Because of Christ, you are enough. And so when we allow God to step into our shame, he takes our eyes off of how we see ourselves and he puts our eyes on Jesus. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And when we put our eyes on Jesus, we start to focus on not what we have done, but what Jesus has done. And God reminds us that he no longer sees us directly but he sees us through Jesus, through Jesus. And because of that, Jesus' identity becomes ours. And again, that involves a process. It involves a process. So some of you right now, maybe you're living that secret life. Maybe you've got some skeletons in the closet, but I believe God wants you to take a breath right now. He does. He wants you to take a deep breath right now. And he wants you to surrender. Surrender. He wants to be part of your life. All of your life. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we come to you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to hear your word. And sir, right now, we're coming to you because a lot of us are carrying weight. We're carrying the weight of our past. We're carrying the weight of our sin. We're carrying the weight of our guilt. We're carrying the weight of, of shame. And Father, we want to be set free from that. And so right now, sir, we're purposing to turn to you. Turn to you. We're acknowledging our sin. We're calling sin for what it is. We're not blaming anyone. We're not saying it was a mishap or a misunderstanding. No, we're calling sin for what it is. It's a sin. God, we're asking you to enter into our shame. Help us 
know that our guilt has been buried, it's been bought and paid for, that it's been nailed to the cross, that it can no longer be held against us. And then, sir, begin the process. Begin the process of restoration. Begin the process of renewing. Begin the process of transforming our minds so that we can see ourselves the way you see us. So that we can start to begin to believe that we are not a mistake, but that we are enough, that we are your children, that we are set apart, that we have your blood running through our veins, that the Holy Spirit is in us, guaranteeing what is to come. Father, we want to see ourselves the way you see us. Help us with that. In Jesus' name we pray and the church said, amen. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Next week we're going to continue our series and we're going to answer the question, how are you feeling? We'll see you later. Wasn't that an amazing message by Pastor Joe? That we can find freedom from our shame, that we can find our identity in who God says we are, that we can find forgiveness from our past mistakes. I want to encourage you guys, if you haven't seen this already, if you go to branchlinechurch.com on our homepage, the digital service will be right there. And we have some digging deeper questions that you can continue conversations about the message that just happened at home with your friends, with your family. So I encourage you, check those out. But now, like I promised at the beginning of the service, and I feel no shame from these, little embarrassment maybe, but I want to encourage you guys to stick around and check out some of these bloopers. Check, check. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh. Could I get a drum roll, please? Yes, you can. <laughs> 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 Hello, everyone. And we are here to fill you. Googly, googly. <laughs> okay. Great googly moogly. We're here to fill. Welcome to Branchline Church's digital service. We're so glad you're here. We want to encourage you to be commenting. We want to, yeah, commenting and staying engaged. Staying engaged. Stay engaged. Woo-hoo. Service. We want to encourage you to be commenting. Stay engaged with what's happening throughout the service. As we want to hear your comments and what's happening as your life is going on. <laughs> service. We're so glad that you're here. We want to encourage you to comment and stay engaged throughout the service in that way. But this morning, yeah, sorry. <laughs> One last time. Say welcome to Branchline Church's digital service, encouraging you to comment. What the heck is going on? <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. Nope. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Pastor Zach, and with me, as always, is Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to crush it. Crushing it. Sorry, I'm slowing us down today. Awesome. So there's a small group for everybody, Pastor Zach? There's a small group for everyone, even you, Pastor Sabrina. <laughs> what? I'm so excited about it. So there's a small group for everybody, Pastor Zach? Oh my gosh, Pastor Sabrina, there's a small group even for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here he comes. <laughs> Sorry, Zach. It happens. Woo! Okay. Now, Pastor Sabrina and I have been updating you on our different ministries throughout this time. No. So much fun. Okay, let's give it a shot of Rooney. Hey, everybody, Pastor Sabrina. Thank you. All right. Okay. Carry on. One last time. There we have resources for kids and resources for parents, as well as some activities. We are also-ing, also-ing, also <laughs> breathing bee kids. We are also eat. Also, we we're also we. Do a check in the mail. Also. <laughs> check in the mail. <laughs> awesome. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Awesome. One last time. An impact, Zach. Yeah, there's a lot of things going awesome on in impact, and ooh, wow. <laughs> we are starting a new sermon series called "Are You." And I just go ahead. Do you guys? Do you guys even get it? <laughs> so yeah, if you want to stay connected and get, no, not stay connected. Stay if you connected wanna... and get <laughs> small groups via Zoom. Um, and so you guys can still sign up for those. One last time. The opportunity to give as we have each week and there's four different ways to give online. 
So first question for Joy, and you got the mic for her. Um, Joy, can you tell us a little bit about like why you got into ministry? <laughs> what is your favorite movie? Yeah. Yeah, because I, you know, she keeps us on our toes because she doesn't have any. What a woman. She's single, guys. Yeah, and... Hey, everybody, Pastor Sabrina. I just hit my chin with... <laughs> Go grab some paper, some crayons, or something to write with, because we're about to get started in a couple minutes here. Go grab your paper, your crayons, or something to write with, because we're getting started soon. Woo! Go grab some paper, a crayon or two or something to write with because we're gonna get started with that real soon. Woo kiddos, go grab some paper, some crayons or something to write with because we are getting started real soon. Woo! It's COVID-19. Yeah. What do you guys want? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, that was good, that was good. Come on, that was good. Whoa, whoa.